Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Ed Smith. Uh, I'm a natural resource specialist with the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension. And uh, I, along with uh, Sonia Sister in the back, we coordinate the Living with Fire program. Uh, the Living with Fire program is an interagency program to help Nevadans live more safely in high fire hazard areas. So we work with local, state, and federal firefighting agencies when we do our programming and develop our materials. Uh, tonight uh, I'm, is part of one of the newest Living with Fire projects that we've got going on. It's called the Washoe County Fire Adapted Communities Project. I see some familiar faces from Rancho Haven uh, from when we did an introduction at the barbecue earlier uh, this summer about the Fire Adapted Community Project. We did some introductions in five different communities around Washoe County, and then we promised to follow up with more in-depth um, discussions. Uh, we did one on uh, ignition-resistant building materials several weeks ago. Uh, we did one on evacuation. Um, two weeks ago, I believe, and then uh, this is our last series uh, for the year, and it's on defensible space. I'm doing what we're doing one here tonight, and then doing another one uh, in Reno tomorrow night. At any rate, uh, and it's again along this idea of fire adapted communities, and fire adapted community in a nutshell is a community that could survive wildfire with little or no assistance from firefighters. Okay, because the way it's built, the way the landscapes are maintained, uh, the skills and knowledge of the people who live in these communities, um, they could survive with little or no assistance. And so that's kind of what the project's about. And so we're talking about the defensible space component for tonight. Now, the things I'm going to share with you are recommendations. About 10 years ago, federal, state, local firefighting agencies came together with the university, and we sat down to try to come up with a set of recommendations for Nevada homeowners on what they should do to reduce the fire threat to their home. Now, these aren't code, these aren't regulations, they're not requirements. What it is is a, a group of people who have had years, over 100 years worth of experience dealing with Nevada firefighting, <clears throat> sitting down and saying, if it was me, this is what I would do, okay? So these aren't requirements. There's, these are recommendations to Nevada homeowners from Nevada's firefighting expertise. Now, tonight what I'm going to talk about is what is defensible space. Uh, we're also going to talk about how wildfire is going to threaten your home because you need to have that background in order to, to apply some defensible space concepts. Uh, we're going to talk about how to create defensible space. Um, I'm going to talk about does it work? Is it effective? And then uh, in particular I'm going to talk about Defensible space in the context of the big sagebrush, bitter brush vegetation type. And that's the vegetation type we have here in between burns when it grows back. Um, after the fire, it's kind of a grass mustard type of thing, which you see out here a little bit on it. But uh, big sagebrush, bitter brush type is uh, a famous type in Nevada for its fire behavior. Those of you who live here, you can't, could not have lived here very long in this type and not know that it burns. And so, with that said, some of you probably from Rancho Haven probably saw this video clip. Uh, but what I'm going to show you is about three or four minutes of this vegetation type burning under extreme conditions. There's two different fires that are going to be shown in this big sagebrush, bitter brush type. Uh, the first one is Foothill Road down uh, south of Genoa in uh, Carson Valley. And then the other one's going to be the Eagle Fire, which was just up here by Doyle in the mid-80s. And you'll recognize the plants. You, know, you all know the sagebrush is the gray-green plant out there, and bitterbrush is the darker green guy that grows taller with it. And so we'll show this video clip, and then we'll get into our discussion. This is Foothill Road down in Carson Valley, if you're familiar with the area. Yeah, look at it come down towards the road. Dark green plant, bitter brush, gray green sagebrush. This vegetation type occurs from Bishop, California to about Susanville, parallels Highway 395. I want it. It's where the trees from the Sierra 
stop. This is usually the first vegetation type we get here along the Sierra front. And it is a who's who's of fires yeah, in Nevada here. along the front here. We better get out of here too. It's going to cross. So this looks just like across the street from the fire station in Rancho Haven. Same, same stuff. Okay, this is the Doyle fire in the mid 80s. Or Eagle fire, excuse me, up by Doyle. Now you'll see some mature Jeffrey pine trees here. So it'll give you a sense for the length of flames being produced. What is defensible space? Well, defensible space is this area between your house and an oncoming wildfire where the vegetation has been managed to reduce the fire threat and to also provide an area for firefighters to safely defend your home. Also, in the event that firefighters are not available to defend your home, defensible space helps improve the odds that your house can survive on its own. So again, it's that area between your house and an oncoming fire where the vegetation has been managed to reduce the fire threat. Now, the term defensible space, as near as we can tell, was first used in 1980 by the California Department of Forestry in uh, fire protection in this publication. And at that time, this was how they defined it or used the term defensible space uh, and provide defensible space that could protect residents and enable firefighting equipment and personnel to operate during wildfire. So as near as we can tell, that's the first time it got used. And at that time, early on in the 80s, the term actually was used a lot in the context of providing a safe area for firefighters to defend your home. Defensible space, an area that they could defend. Now that definition has changed over time. Um, we've come to the realization now that it's unreasonable for us to expect that firefighters are going to be able to defend every home. And so the concepts kind of evolved to where this concept of the house surviving on its own um, is becoming more and more prominent in the use of the term defensible space. So, uh, and getting more, uh, shifting the responsibility away from the fire service to the homeowners, to uh, them being the most important person in making sure their home survives a fire. Well, working with uh, Nevada's uh, firefighting agencies, we came up with a term, uh, our own definition of defensible space in the 90s. And what we've used is what I had mentioned earlier. Again, defensible space is that area between a house and an oncoming wildfire where the vegetation has been managed to reduce the threat and allow firefighters to safely defend the home. In the event firefighters are not available, defensible space also improves the likelihood of the house surviving without assistance. Again, that's consistent uh, concept with the fire adapted communities idea. Okay, so that's what it is. Now, why do we want defensible space? Because it can change the fire behavior of an approaching wildfire uh, to improve the odds your house will survive. 
Defensible space is going to change the behavior of that fire as it approaches your home. That's why you want it, because that's going to help improve the odds your home will survive. When we talk about fire behavior, there's three things that control fire behavior. Weather, topography, and fuels. These three things determine um, how easy the fire is to start, what direction it's going to go, how intense it's going to burn, how easy it is to control, how can we, uh, suppression opportunities. So if we, uh, these three things control that. So if we want to change those or change fire behavior, we need to modify weather, topography, or fuels. But of those three things, we can only change one component. We can't modify the weather. We can't really change the topography that our house sets on. But we can change the fuels. And so if we want to change fire behavior to improve the survivability of our home, we need to create defensible space or modify the vegetation or fuels around our home. And when we say wildfire fuels, often we're talking about wildland vegetation, so the sagebrush and bitterbrush that's growing out there. Vegetation is fuels for wildfire. Um, the ornamental plants that you've planted in your landscapes can be wildfire fuel. And when houses get involved, houses can become fuel. And so our opportunity to change the fire behavior to improve the survivability of our home through defensible space lies in our ability to change these three things. And when we talk about changing fuels, this is what we're talking about. We want to reduce the amount of fuel available to burn. Less fuel is better than more fuel. We want to shorten the height of the fuels. Shorter fuels are better than taller fuels. We want to increase the moisture content. The more moisture there is in plant tissue, the harder it is to ignite, the slower it burns, the cooler it burns. Decrease the continuity or how densely packed the vegetation is growing. Is the vegetation really thick and dense or are they widely separated? The more widely separated, uh, uh, the better from a defensible space standpoint. And then locating fuels or vegetation properly on our landscape. So this is how we're going to change the fuels to change the fire behavior. And if we're successful in changing those attributes of fuels, we will make a fire harder to start, burn slower, burn cooler, have shorter flames, and burn for a shorter time, all of which are conducive to helping your house survive the fire. And so that's why defensible space is important. It's going to change the fire behavior of the approaching wildfire as, as it approaches your home. Okay, now before we get into the recommendations on defensible space, we've got to have a feel for how wildfire is going to threaten our home. And it's going to threaten our home in one or a combination of these ways, direct contact by flames, flames actually touching our homes, radiated heat, and flying embers. And we're going to talk about those three things. Threaten your home in three ways, contact by flames, radiated heat, and flying embers. Contact by flames is probably what most people envision when they think of wildfires threatening homes. This occurs when a fire burns close enough to the house that flames touch and ignite the home. Radiated heat is produced by invisible electromagnetic waves. They travel out in all directions from a flame. When a house receives enough radiated heat for a sufficient time, it will ignite without flames ever touching it. Sometimes radiated heat can burst windows and let burning embers get inside the house. Radiant heat melted the vinyl siding on this house. Flames never touched it. But most homes are destroyed because of flying embers. During a wildfire, pieces of burning material, such as branches, pine cones, and wood shakes from a burning roof, can be lofted high into the air and carried hundreds of feet to more than a mile from the actual fire. Burning embers can also be carried by wind and fire whirls. If these burning embers land on easily ignitable materials, such as wood shake or shingle roofs, leaves and rain gutters, dry weeds, trash, or wood piles, a new fire can start. Okay, three ways that it's going to threaten your home. Contact by flames, radiated heat, and flying embers. But the reason most homes burn is because flying embers land on something on or near your home that's easily ignitable. Start little fires and little fires um, ignite your home and become big fires. And I'm going to show you some clips here of embers, give you a sense for the ember issue. But the winds have kind of been picking up in the last few minutes or so, and that's what 
crews here are worried about. They've been cutting down trees in this area, hoping it doesn't spread into the downtown. Now, that's some of that video that we shot earlier. That's taken actually of Via de Santa Fe and Via de la Valle, where at least three homes were on fire. Now, these burning embers just filled the sky. It looked like a rainstorm of fire and ash. And firefighters say the big problem in that area are the palm trees because, you know, they go up very quickly. The embers spread to other areas, and they say that's how this particular So these are embers started. that are being lofted up and coming down like nearby. snow. These are embers that are wind-driven, so they're going to hit your house like hail during a hailstorm. And then we saw this earlier clip of, a, uh, of kind of a... a whirlwind carrying embers. And I'm kind of overdoing it on the embers, but the embers is a big deal, okay? And uh, it's part of an effective defensible space. This is an interview with a homeowner in, from the Waterfall Fire in Carson City. This homeowner knows too well about flying embers and how close he came to losing it all at the height of the waterfall blaze in Carson City. We didn't actually have any flames touch the house whatsoever. There was a lot of heat in the area. We had a, a window explode from the heat, uh, but no flames actually reached the house. Uh, it was strictly embers that were blown by the wind up against the house and, and trapped up against the house. But you still could have lost the house were it not for some firefighters and, as you say, luck? Oh, um, we were about as close to losing the house as you could ever lose it and not lose it. Um, the house was technically on fire when the firemen saw the smoke and stuff. And uh, if, it, if it was not for the firemen, my house would have gone down. There, there was no one around to save it. So what happened was... Uh, everybody's evacuated in his neighborhood. Firefighters are leaving as the fire front's moving towards his neighborhood. And firefighters see smoke coming out of the vents. So they, they see smoke coming out of the firewood pile stacked next to the house. Um, in various locations, it's burning the wood mulches. And fortunately, they stopped and extinguished those little fires and then left. And that's what um, helped this house. Now, are you folks familiar with pine bark nuggets, mulch you, you buy at Home Depot? That's what was here. And embers um, landed in the pine bark mulch and ignited it. Okay, so it's, it's charred um, the landscape timbers. The heat coming off of this was so intense it scorched green lawn, which is, is tough to do. Fortunately, we had a non-combustible area of green lawn and cement sidewalk that separated this wood mulch planter from the wood-sided house. Okay? Saved them. One of the things we're going to talk about here later today is a non-combustible area within three to five feet of the side of your house. Um, because the embers, we'll, we'll talk about this, but when the embers come, they're going to strike the side of your house and they're going to fall down and they're going to accumulate here. We do not want anything easily ignitable in this spot. Uh, this homeowner said he had wood scraps, a dead shrub, some dried grass there that ignited. And that, the flames from that were able to get up underneath the, um, the plate, underneath the siding, got in and penetrated the wall cavity of this, um, of the house. Fortunately, you can see firefighters saw the smoke, cut this out with a chainsaw, extinguished it before they left. Okay, what's significant in this picture is, this is the wood pile. This wood pile was stacked up next to the house. These firefighters just started tossing it to get it away from the home. You know, this homeowner reflected later and said, why was it their job to move my wood pile? It was his job. <laughs> he had this wood pile stacked right under, uh, next to the house underneath this wood deck, and it was smoldering, so it could have ignited. All right, so the thing you need to do on this ember situation, you need to look at your property in a different light now. You need to assume during a fire that everything that's easily ignitable on or near your home will be burning. And the question's going to be, will that be enough to ignite my home? Anything you've ever used for campfire, or to start a campfire, pine needles, paper, small twigs, kindling, during fire season, you do not want on or near your home, okay? Okay, with that said, let's talk about how do we create defensible space. Okay, 
Defensible space involves five fundamental concepts, okay? And we're going to talk about each of these five. Know your distance. How far out from your house do you need to worry about? Remove the dead. Remove dead vegetation. Probably your number one priority. Create separation between dense trees and shrubs. Um, remove ladder fuels. We'll talk about that. And make a lean, clean, and green area for at least 30 feet. Anyway, so we're going to talk about these five concepts. And so what we're going to do is I want you to imagine yourself walking out the back door of your house and thinking about these five concepts as it applies to your backyard. Know your distance. How far out from your house? Well, when you hear defensible space distances, it's usually expressed as the distance out from the footprint of your home. So if you hear 30 feet, 100 feet, or whatever, um, that's what they're talking about. And what we recommend in the Living with Fire recommendations is that in this big sagebrush, bitter brush type, right here on level to gently sloping ground, we're talking about 100 feet. And, we, and the reason for that is we saw the fire behavior in that earlier footage. This type can produce some pretty dramatic fire behavior. Um, if you're on steeper slopes, you'd want to go more. Okay? The steeper the slope that your home is on, um, uh, the more dramatic the fire behavior could become. So if in our scenario here, this house, level of gently sloping ground, big sagebrush, bitter brush type, we're talking about 100 feet. Um, what you do is mark off that 100 feet around your home, tie it off with flagging or strips or cloth, um, just so you get a feel for what 100 feet looks like. If it extends onto your neighbor's boundary, do not do work on somebody else's property without their permission first. Uh, if it borders up with BLM, BLM has uh, indicated that the, um, they're receptive to homeowners working on their land. I'd ask them first, but uh, in order to get the effective defensible space you need on it, so they're trying to be good partners. Anyway, so mark it. So the first uh, step is uh, how big, 100 feet in our example, mark it. And the next four concepts are going to apply with what's growing within that four, uh, 100 feet around your home. In order for you to get 100 feet, this is one of the sticklers, one of our issues for homes and developments in this vegetation type, is that in order to have 100 feet, at a minimum, you're going to have to own an acre and a half and be located in the middle. And so when we get into small lots, you are your neighbor's keeper. And so defensible space needs to be implemented on a neighborhood level. You're all in the same boat and um, need to work together in order to get that adequate space. The other thing that helps you out too is if you're on the periphery of your neighborhood and you butt up against um, BLM land, Forest Service land, county, open space, <clears throat> You're fortunate because we have a lot going on in Washoe County with these agencies doing fuels on their property. And so if you extend onto their property, they may have something in the works that you might want to coordinate with as far as projects. And so that we haven't planned these different types of fuels treatment independent of each other, that there may be some uh, advantage to doing things together or planning together. All right, the next concept in defensible space. Within our defensible space area that we've marked off, our 100 foot around that house, that footprint of the house, is there any dead vegetation? If you don't do anything else, do this, okay? A lot of times when we, we talk about defensible space, it seems so overwhelming to people, um, and you can't eat an elephant all in one setting, okay? So if you're gonna prioritize, and you can't do all the things, try to do this before next fire season on your property, within that defensible space area, manage your dead fuels. And by dead fuels, we're talking about dead branches. One of the things about this type of bitter brush we have here in western Nevada, it grows very tall, leggy, and what's nasty about it, it retains its dead wood upright. If the dead wood were to fall off and lay on the ground, it would decompose faster, it would get more moisture out of the ground, <clears throat> be less of a threat, but the fact that it's standing upright and it's tall increases its, its uh, uh, hazard to you. So we don't want any dead vegetation within our 100 feet, so we're gonna have to prune out the bitter brush, the dead out of the bitter brush. If we got dead sagebrush in there, get rid of this dead. If you have pine needles, uh, dried fallen leaves, dead leaves, um, to do the best you can to remove those up. And on these defensible space concepts, what's important to understand too, and you may not be able to do that whole 100 feet, um, keep in mind that the closer you do things to your house, the more valuable it is, okay? 
the farther out we get, um, may not be as critical as what we do. So the closer we get to our house, the more intense we need to manage and to be concerned about these things. Dried grass and weeds, one of our problems in this vegetation type is that when we remove the shrub component, the bitter brush and the sagebrush, we actually a lot of times release cheat grass because sagebrush and bitter brush consume moisture from the soil and nutrients. When they're not there, that's all becomes available to the cheat grass crop on it. And, and by doing this, if we don't control the cheat grass part of this, um, we've oftentimes defeated the purpose <laughs> of our defensible space. May not have the fire behavior, but we've probably increased the likelihood of it igniting. And as you all probably know out here, cheat grass, uh, dried cheat grass, uh, ignites very easily and burns very rapidly. So if you got that, we need to mow um, cheat grass. Like, um, like you were saying, your weed eater's your best friend um, on it. Wildflowers, like uh, mule's ear, balsam root, lupin, and all those guys, when they're green and actively growing, great, keep them. They're going to be mostly moisture. They're going to be about 70% water, uh, water content by weight when they're green. They're the worst thing to have when they're dried. So when grasses and wildflowers cure out, we need to remove those, uh, they just because they can ignite so easily. Remove that top growth, we won't injure them. They'll be good. So for the conclusion of step two, removing dead fuels, if we have dead fuels, dead shrubs, dried grass, that sort of stuff, we need to remove it. All right, the next step, create separation. If we have dense trees or dense shrubs, we need to break those up. Okay, the greater the density, more hazard. We've got more fuel, not less fuel is better, so we need to thin this out. Um, the rule of thumb that we use, again, it's just a rule of thumb, but uh, provide a separation between the shrubs, two times the height of the typical shrub in that. So if your sagebrush is two feet tall, thin them out to create a separation of four feet tall. If you want to create small islands, mosaics, those types of things, but again, uh, we're trying to break up uh, the shrub component in these areas, like that. Um, if we're in a timber type, like this uh, big sagebrush, bitter brush type, when we get up to the Galena area on it, we start um, meeting uh, the Jeffrey pine trees. If we have dense trees, we want to separate them uh, by 10 feet. Out here on the junipers, I would treat the junipers as shrubs, and get a separation of twice the height. So if we have dense shrubs in this area, we need to thin them out, like that. Okay, the next idea is ladder fuels. Next concept in defensible space. If we have trees um, in our defensible space area, we need to remove ladder fuels. Ladder fuels are vegetation that could allow a fire burning at a lower level to move up into a higher level. So something burning in pine needles, dried grass, the ignite sagebrush, the bitter brush, which we get the low tree branches of the pine tree to ignite. And so what we want, these are the rungs of the ladder. So we need to remove some of the rungs of these ladders. We do not want these trees, especially the big Jeffrey pines, um, to ignite. They represent a tremendous amount of heat. We don't want them to ignite by our home. And I'm gonna show you a little clip of ladder fuels in action. So we've got some small trees down here that are burning. Uh, ground fuel's got the small trees to go. Now they're moving up. They're gonna be moving up into this tree. We do not want the big trees to ignite. Lots of small, short trees that we should have thinned out, should have limbed up. Uh, 
Voilà. All right, so we need to provide a separation. In the recommendation that we've come up with on mature trees, um, creating a separation of 10 feet, so removing the lower tree branches, removing the shrub component from underneath the, the drip line or the tips of the branches of the trees. Um, but if you have smaller trees, we never want to remove more than a third of a tree's total branches. Again, it, it'll be detrimental to the vigor of the tree. So if we have ladder fields present in our defensible space, I'm going to remove them. All right, the fifth component of creating defensible space is make it lean, clean, and green. For an area for at least 30 feet um, around the footprint of our homes, we want to make it lean, clean, and green. Lean, um, relatively low amounts of fuels available to burn, low amount of vegetation. Clean, our maintenance is immaculate during fire season in this area. We don't allow any dead material to accumulate, pine needles, branches, dead branches, dry grass. In green, in green meaning we got our, our plants under irrigation, so we can keep that moisture content up high in our uh, landscape plants. Get more moisture is better. So the lean, clean, and green area uh, is typically the residential landscape. And we are able to do things in this area that's 30 feet around our house that we don't, can't do elsewhere on our property. One of the ones is that we can provide irrigation. Irrigation in Nevada is the great equalizer. Uh, allows us to use a lot more uh, variety of plant materials than we could if we did not have uh, irrigation. This is typically the area that we maintain the most to. It's our most intensive maintenance. And like I said earlier, the closer we get to this house, the more important things become the more, more rigorous we need to be during fire season in regards to our, our maintenance. So within this lean, clean, and green area, or this at least 30-foot area, we remove most of the flammable wildland plants from this area. In this area, and these would probably be the big three for out here, big sagebrush, state flower of Nevada, um, bitter brush, rabbit brush, which if you're allergic to, you're probably having a miserable night because it's in flower right now. And cheatgrass, as well as the dried mustard out here, you see out this window. Again, nothing, uh, no dead fields. And so we don't want a lot of this within 30 feet of our home. And so we want to remove these guys. Now, if you want to keep something for a specimen plant, keep it cleaned up, keep the dead wood out of it, keep it separated from its cousins out there in the wildlands, that's okay. Uh, one of the these two guys, you can't prune up very well. They just look hideous. Uh, bitter brush, on the other hand, uh, does prune well. Some people make hedges out of them and cleans up nicely. But um, just uh, special um, uh, specimen plants. Uh, the other thing, too, to think about on it, um, these two guys, uh, big sagebrush and this uh, form of bitter brush down, that you have down here, they don't re-sprout. And so if you cut them off flush with the ground, they're going to come back by seed. If they do, they're not going to re-sprout. This guy is an active re-sprouter, and that's a, it, you may have to get to herbicides if you have a lot of rabbit brush to control. Cheatgrass, same thing as you're in the cheatgrass business forever until you pave it or put lawn there. Um, we have a great fact sheet if you go to the Cooperative Extension website. Um, uh, homeowner's Guide to Cheatgrass Control, and uh, um, we'll tell you everything you want to know about controlling cheatgrass. And like I said, our natives, the Utah juniper that we have out here, probably a lot of you folks have seen it firsthand, um, burn and what it can do, pinion pine and bitterbrush, they all uh, can burn very intensely. But we do have some natives that are good choices. Like I said, the wildflowers that we have, like um, lupin and phlox and balsam root, when they're green and actively growing, if you like them, keep them. But when they cure out, you've got to remove that top growth. Again, no dead fuels. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, desert peach, which we have out here. We all know it because it's flaming reddish pink in May. Um, that shrub, it's almost got a cult following in Nevada, in western Nevada. You know, people just love this guy. Um, if you keep it cleaned up, it does retain dead wood. The tent caterpillars get it a lot of times, and so you have dead segments of it. Keep that uh, pruned out. 
It's a very open shrub. It does not have uh, much uh, volume to it at all. So there's not a lot of fuel there, and, and it does have a very dramatic uh, flower to it. If you like it, keep it. Just keep it cleaned up. It's a, it's a better choice of the shrubs. It's also an active resprouter. Um, just about everything else out there resprouts. Mormon tea resprouts, the horsebrush, uh, and the desert peach, and the rabbit rush. Okay, so remove the flammable shrubs. We don't want these plants within our 30 feet, and select better plants. Unfortunately, we don't rate plants like we rate roofs. You know, and so we can get a, a class A roof has been rated to have the highest fire resistance. Unfortunately, we don't do that for plants. But we do have some rules of thumb on better choices. But um, all things considered, a shorter plant's better than a taller plant. Um, herbaceous plants are better than woody plants. Herbaceous plants are non-woody. They don't have wood stems, so that's going to be daffodils, grass, columbines. Um, woody plants would be shrubs and trees. So you want herbaceous plants are typically better than woody plants because herbaceous plants, when green and growing, are what? Mostly water. Yes, yeah, high moisture content. Woody plants are probably down around 50 to 60 percent during the summer, and so the herbaceous plants are better. Um, when it comes down to woody plants, deciduous is better than evergreen. And again, it's a rule of thumb. The reason for that being that evergreen plants tend to uh, have volatile oils, resins within their leaf tissue, which increases their heat content when they burn. At any rate, so given that, those rules of thumb, lawn is an excellent choice. It's not right for everybody. It's probably got the highest maintenance requirement of anything you put in your landscape. Also likes water. On the other hand, some of it strategically located on your lot is a good choice um, in a defensible space. Green, well-maintained lawn. Okay, herbaceous plant materials, phlox, hosta, blanket flower, um, what is that, fuchsia? All right. I'm not really an ornamental plant guy, and so <laughs> some of it's a stretch for me. At any rate, these are good choices. Again, green, well-maintained, no dead in them. Ah, good choices within that 30 feet. So lawn, herbaceous plants, the herbaceous ground covers, good choices. Again, green, actively growing. We maintain, within those 30 feet, we maintain them intensely during fire season so there's no accumulation of dead. The only knock on these guys, and this is especially true for ivy, is that uh, they tend to accumulate dead leaves underneath them and it becomes a maintenance issue and we don't clean that stuff out and that's a liability, the dead stuff. So if we have them, just make sure we keep track to make that there's no dead material. Now if we want to use shrubs in this 30 foot area, we want to emphasize lower growing deciduous shrubs, preferably two foot. Again, shorter is better than taller. Uh, so spireas, barberries, those guys, all good choices. Uh, if we want some trees um, in our area, that's good. We just want to make sure that the mature uh, canopy of that tree is at least 10 feet from the house when it, when it all grows in. But emphasize deciduous trees. This is an important thing, too. We want to think of plants in terms of good plants versus bad plants. Um, and probably this is the, one of the most true statements out there, is that how you take care of a plant is just as important, if not more so, than which species of plant you pick. A good plant can become a bad one through neglect, if it's diseased, has dead material in it, whereas a, quote, bad plant could be met, made less hazardous through pruning and cleaning up and that kind of stuff. And so how we take care of our plants uh, is probably just as important as the species we select. Now, we're going to talk about poor choices. If any of you have been keeping track of the news over the past week, we heard about another apartment juniper fire in Reno. And our general recommendation is, is we do not want to use or, uh, ornamental evergreen uh, shrubs or trees, okay, arborvitaes, junipers within this 30 feet. Um, this is... Um, uh, uh, ornamental juniper burning, the home landscape. Burning ember landed in the crown of this. Let me show you this video clip of a burning juniper, ornamental juniper. This is like Chinese juniper, tam juniper, tamarisk. Um, all right, these guys can burn pretty hot and they can be ignited by embers. 
And the reason, what really gets them, and there's all kinds of ideas floating out there why, just about every attribute of the shrub lends itself to burning um, quite well. Um, not the least of which is the resins and oils in the, in the, in the leaves. Uh, however, what I think is the big factor is that it retains um, dead wood, or uh, excuse me, uh, dead leaves. Okay, this is another juniper fire, this one, apartment fire. We've had a lot of these, seems like a couple every year now anymore. This is in the middle of Carson City. And um, uh, an apartment dweller apparently flicked a cigarette into the crown of one of these junipers and started this fire. And this is what I'm talking about, <clears throat> is when they get old and mature, you pull back that nice green wall and look inside and it's gonna be brown inside. And even though they're evergreens, doesn't mean that they don't lose their leaves. They lose some of their leaves every year, but it's just that some of them stay green. Well, where do all those dead leaves go that they drop every year? Well, if you pull back the branches, you will see handfuls of this dead stuff. And the dead stuff on a hot August day is, not, is gonna have very little moisture in it. So it's gonna be very easy to ignite. So it's gonna be very dry, easy to ignite, but it's still gonna have those resins and volatile oils in the leaves on it. And so what we found is this phenomenon of these embers landing during a fire, setting inside the crown in this stuff and igniting. Now, I'm gonna show you, this is a handful of that stuff. Okay, and this is, um, uh, this is a charcoal briquette that I've just set on this thing and I'm gonna turn the fan on. And so this is what that, that this is just a handful out of one of these mature juniper shrubs. There's probably hundreds of handfuls in, in one big one. So imagine hundreds of those in an ember during a fire and having a big bank of these planted as a foundation planting next to our home. Okay, bad choice, poor choice. Hopefully now this picture strikes a chord with you folks after what we've talked about here today. This is a bad idea. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about plant placement. If you have a wood-sided home, you, you really have to have extra care on what's within five feet or within this 30 feet of your house, I should say. You know, stucco, non-combustible siding, not as bad, but you still have to be aware. You still have some vulnerabilities with your windows and things like that. Um, we don't want mass plantings of shrubs in front of our windows. The windows are the weakest, most vulnerable part of the exterior of your home. So we don't want that part of our home to be, um, to receive a lot of heat. We don't want woody plants in front of our foundation vents or underneath our soffit vents if we have them up in our eaves. Again, the woody plants are more likely to produce burning embers that can penetrate through the vents, okay? Herbaceous plants, good, that type of thing. Uh, no big mass plantings of woody plants in corners where two walls come together on the exterior and plant them there. That, re uh, that makes a hazardous condition. And of particular importance if you have a wood deck on a slope. Okay, what's particularly important is if you have a deck on the downhill side is what's growing downhill from that deck. All right, extra care. Um, no big mass shrub plantings. We don't want something below that deck that's going to generate embers and heat that's going to uh, come up underneath our deck. Emphasize non-combustible surfaces within that 30 feet. Concrete, gravel, pavers, great. Mulches. Okay, we need to be careful with our mulch selection. Um, we'll talk about this in a moment, but we don't, it's not a good idea to use wood, bark, or shredded rubber mulches within five feet of the foundation of our house. We use them in that 30-foot area. We don't want a mass use of it a lot of it, especially if it's something that could allow something burning in the, the sagebrush and cheatgrass, could ignite the mulch and come and burn close enough to our home. We want our use of mulch to be separated by non-combustible surface, just like we showed in uh, Mr. Lappin's house at the beginning. He had his pine bark nugget mulch ignited, but fortunately that flower bed was separated by a non-combustible surface. They don't typically produce much, uh, very long flames, and so if we separate them with, you know, three plus more feet of grass or concrete, um, we're okay, we don't have to worry about it. But here is, uh, uh, we did an evaluation in Carson City Fire Department a couple of years ago on eight different popular landscape mulches. 
under extreme fire weather, just like on a hot August day, and put them under wind, and uh, they all failed the test. What I'm going to show you here is uh, Gorilla Hair. It's also called Western Red Cedar. You can get it at Lowe's, Home Depot, by the bag. Very popular um, landscape mulch. And so what's going to happen is he's going to, these plots have been setting out all summer in Carson City at the airport. He's going to light them and then turn the fan on to simulate fire weather. And this is how Gorilla Hair burns. Okay, now the fan's going to be turned on. You're going to hear some popping. Those are firecrackers. We use those to help time how fast the fire moved. So it's already across the plot now. Okay. So how we use mulches needs to be uh, of interest uh, in our defensible space as well. Problem tree limbs, no overhanging limbs within 10 feet of chimneys, um, not within six feet of the house, so we want to prune those out, make sure uh, we have clear space around our power lines with our tree limbs. All right, so we're getting kind of the end to the lean, clean, and green. What I've been saying, what I've said several times here tonight is the closer we get to our house, the more intense our management and decisions need to be. And this non-combustible area within three to five feet of the house is probably our most important. And the reason for that, again, is the embers, when they come, they're going to strike the side of the house and they're going to pile up. So just like how snow piles up in certain locations on your home during the winter, or how leaves pile up in certain locations on your home during the fall, these embers are going to pile up in certain spots. And if they're piling up in something easily ignitable, um, we could be in trouble. So this needs to be our non-combustible area. We don't want anything in this area that could be easily ignited by embers. Um, this house, they fortunately had uh, raked up the pine needles and leaves away from this house. This was from uh, the Los Alamos fire in New Mexico. Um, and this fire was actually mostly an understory fire that burned through the pine needles and debris and ignited these older wood-sided homes. I think there's 260 homes lost in that fire, I can't, I think. At any rate, fortunately they had cleaned away that debris from this home, this house was saved. Based on what we've said here tonight, this should raise the hair up on the back of your neck. We got um, junipers, we got dried grass, and we have uh, wood mulch next to a wood-sided home with windows right here. Okay, so just about everything wrong, okay? So that zero to five feet, this would flunk our test. This is not a non-combustible area. What we want to emphasize in this three to five feet around our home, uh, the herbaceous plants, um, gravels, rock, paver, lawn, um, those types of things. Um, that's what the emphasis in our landscape would be. Again, we'd, and we're not going to put our wood pile in this area. We're not going to have open garbage cans that have paper and stuff. E nothing easily ignitable within this area. That's our, one of our priorities. And so to kind of summarize this lean, clean, and green area, um, within our 30 feet of the house, if we have trees, we're going to emphasize deciduous trees, but their mature size is going to be 10 feet from the house. Within 3 to 5 feet of our house, we're going to emphasize herbaceous plants. If we have shrubs, they're going to be low-growing shrubs. We're not going to put them in front of the vents. Um, if we want um, junipers and mugo pines and those kinds of things, we like them, we'll, we'll plant them at least 30 feet from our home. Um, if we have a fuel break or area that we don't want to irrigate and, but we want to keep the weeds down, uh, we have some options like crested wheat. And crested wheat has been planted all through here. It's the typical grass that gets planted after these areas burn to try to uh, control soil erosion and things like that. All right, so finally, with uh, our final step, um, is there a lean, clean, and green area within 30 feet? So create it. And then finally, you are in the defensible space business forever because plants grow back. And so what you need to do is to go through each of these steps, the beginning of fire season, and do what's necessary and do the required maintenance because Vegetation is continually growing. 
Finally, does defensible space work? If we do these five things to this property and get this look, will it really make a difference? Well, we have lots of anecdotal information out there that says it does. This is from the Belle Isle Ranch fire in Reno in 96. Joan, around there? At any rate, um, these were interviews with firefighters and attributing a number of homes that were saved because of the, these homeowners had effective defensible space. So first-hand eyewitness accounts. But we also have some research that's been done. And a lot of it's been done in California, although more is happening now and elsewhere. Um, let me back up here. What this graphic shows is this row, were, these are houses that were destroyed by wildfire in Southern California. Um, this is the results for houses that had wood shake roofs. This is the row for houses that had fire resistant roofs. And then these areas indicate the amount of defensible space that they had. And so this row of houses had either none or less than 30 feet of effective defensible space. Uh, this row had 30 to 80 feet of defensible space, 80 to 100 and more than 100. Okay. For the houses with uh, fire resistant roofs, You'll see, uh, that had less than 30 feet of defensible space, those 24% of the homes that had less than 30% of the homes were destroyed by the fire, that were threatened by it. By just having 30 to 80, that number drops down to only 5% were destroyed. Made a big difference. Now look at when we combine having a fire resistant roof with an effective defensible space. 50% of the homes that had inadequate defensible space and wood shake roofs were destroyed in this fire. Ones with fire resistant roofs and, and 100 feet or more, only 1% were destroyed. Pretty good evidence. There was another study uh, done in California, I believe in the paint fire, uh, and they found, again, this very similar correlation. 86% home survival for homes with 30 feet or more of defensible space in uh, a non-flammable roof. And this brings out an important point. What you're seeing in this data is two important factors. Defensible space and roofing material, okay? And the point I want to make is it's important to have defensible space, but it's also important to have an ignition-resistant house because defensible space can't mitigate all the fire threat. And here's the example, and that's why we had um, three weeks ago our ignition-resistant building materials workshop like this one, but this being on defensible space. Okay, so this house at Face Valley, this is the Waterfall Fire, Carson City. This is sagebrush, bitterbrush going down here in Jeffrey Pines. Um, looked like it had a great defensible space around here. Um, what happened were uh, there must have been weeds, grass, pine needles or something, something easily ignitable accumulated underneath this deck. Fortunately, this firefighter saw smoke and you can see spot fires, you know, mulches and stuff burning in the flower beds over here. So embers were, were landing here. Uh, this guy fortunately saw smoke coming out from this deck, stopped, again, the neighborhood's evacuated, uh, took a chainsaw, cut it out, and, ignite, and extinguished that fire. Even though this is a stucco house, uh, tile roof, nice green lawn all around it, uh, very well ma manicured landscape, we could have lost this house just because of poor maintenance on, on weeds, easily ignitable stuff near this home. Um, so, in, defensible space is important, you need to do it, but you also need to think about the maintenance on your house, what it's made of, how it's maintained. We talk about that in the materials back there. A defensible space does not mitigate a wood shake shingle roof, um, unfortunately. We, we, we found out what defensible space is, we found out how wildfire can threaten our home, we figured out, we heard how to create it with the five concepts. Um, we found out that it's effective, it does make a difference. We found out that it, it by itself is, is not enough, that we need to also worry about other things. Well, to kind of wrap it up, um, defensible space requires people to be proactive. You can't worry about this the day that the fire starts and is coming towards your home and think that you're gonna go take care of everything really quickly. And for those of you who have heard me say this before, I apologize, but this picture, because I use it a lot, this house was, according to the story, 
was the only house that survived on this ridge in California's 49er fire. 49er fire is over by Grass Valley, Nevada City, California, in the 80s. Um, and this, it got nicknamed the Miracle House. And so it showed up on billboards and magazines, um, PSAs all over the place, the Miracle House. Well, I always had heartburn over calling this the Miracle House because by definition, a miracle is something that happens that is so extraordinary, we can't explain it with the laws of science. Well, this is not a miracle. This, why this house survived is completely explainable. It was designed, maintained to survive. Um, had a fire-resistant roof, had used gravel for its non-combustible area, uh, had a green, well-maintained landscape, modified the wild, native wildland fuels around it, had turnaround areas for fire equipment, had lots of stuff going for it. And if we had a whole neighborhood of this type of house and this type of attitude of a homeowner, this would be, coming, would be what we're thinking about in terms of a fire-adapted community. A whole neighborhood of people like this. But it requires you to be proactive. And this is the uh, sheer luck uh, scenario uh, that we got. This is, all three of these are the same house. And this is in Carson City. The middle one is the waterfall fire in the background. Um, some years before the waterfall fire, I was driving by this neighborhood and I took this picture of a neighborhood that needed to worry about the wildfire threat. And just by sheer happenstance, a Reno Gazette Journal reporter stood at the same place I had stood at the years earlier during the waterfall fire and took the same picture, take picture from the same spot I was standing. I saw it on the front page of the Reno Gazette, and then I came back and retook it after the fire. Now, look at the changes, what happened. Same house, but uh, action had taken place. This house had a wood shake roof, had overgrown bitter brush and sagebrush. Um, around this house. Sometime before the waterfall fire, though, this homeowner had changed out his roof, had thinned out the native vegetation, created a uh, defensible, land, uh, defensible space, a good uh, effective landscape, built a deck but enclosed the bottom so we wouldn't have to worry about debris and weeds and stuff accumulating underneath it. And those factors helped contribute to this house not being one of the 17 homes that was lost um, during this fire. You gotta be proactive. And with that, that's what I have to say.